And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're getting this information. My name is Rafael Vasquez from your show, Líderes del Futuro on KBBF Bilingual Radio, 89.1 FM in the Sonoma County area and the surrounding counties and online at kbbf.org. Remember, my YouTube channel is Líderes del Futuro and my podcast is also Líderes del Futuro. If you want to listen to my TikToks, it is Líderes underscore del underscore Futuro with a double O. Today we have the opportunity and the privilege to have a conversation with uh, John Cabana. Um, and I'm sure I'm mispronouncing the, the name, but that's okay. You used to be the executive director, president, a huge title over there um, at this uh, Institute uh, for Policy Studies. Um, First of all, welcome to the show, and thank you for making the time to be with us today. Great to be with you. I love the work you do. Thank you. So, um, again, you have been involved out there in somewhat investigation, somewhat, you know, research. Um, and I had the privilege to recently read this beautiful piece called The Water Defenders, How Ordinary People Save a Country from corporate uh, greed. Um, tell us first, what type of work do you do? And then we'll get into, again, trying to understand, um, you know, what is life right. and why we must protect it so that we can protect ourselves. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for the opportunity to talk about this. I work at an institute that's kind of unique, the Institute for Policy Studies. We do work with social movements. So we do research, writing, communications work with social movements who are taking on big corporations mm -hmm. or government when it's doing the wrong thing. Our theory of social change is that most of the stuff we need in the world, peace, justice, environment, the biggest impediment is large corporations with too much power and too much of our government resources going into the military. And the only way to counter that is through powerful social movements. Mm -hmm. So we work with them here in the United States and we work with them overseas. And some of our partners in Latin America have come through a fascinating channel that, that was born in tragedy, which is that at our Institute 44 years ago, we had an amazing Chilean named Orlando Letelier. And he was targeted by the Chilean dictatorship mm -hmm who sent an assassination team, this will seem unreal to your listeners, but to Washington DC mm -hmm. to assassinate him. And they yeah. planted a bomb under his car and they <clears throat> killed, they detonated it on his way to work. And so he and an American colleague were killed uh, in 1976. Mm -hmm. And finally, by the way, the dictator Pinochet was found responsible for this. His, the head of his intelligence agency was put in jail for a while. But we give human rights awards every year in their names. And in 2009, people came to us with these water defenders of, of Northern El Salvador. But we, we have a number of, of partners in Latin America that have come to us through these awards, through their mm -hmm. extraordinary work, mainly groups nobody's heard of, unsung heroes who are doing work in the trenches and who, who come to us and, and through the award, we help publicize their work. Seldom do we turn it into a 10 year project mm -hmm. to work with them, which we'll get into in this conversation. But so I have the best job in the world, Raphael, except maybe you who get to talk to all sorts of fun people and teach. Um, but I get to work with some of the most dynamic social movements and social movement leaders in the world. And it's pure joy. Definitely. And again, um, it's important to understand that a lot of the people that you end up giving these awards to, uh, they may speak Spanish as a second language, uh, English possibly as a third language. Many of them, especially in Latin America, are um, indigenous individuals who, again, uh, sometimes in the Western way of thinking, um, their level of education is very low, even though you know, in their communities, they may be uh, in leadership roles, right. um, but they are taken for granted uh, a lot of the time. And so it's not like they are, the other thing is, it's not that they are seeking their word, right. is that they are doing the work that needs to be done. Right. In Spanish, uh, uh, we call it el tequio, where you do what you need to do, not because you're expecting anything in return, it's just your social responsibility to do. 
And that brings us into this beautiful um, book that you wrote. Um, I was mentioning before we started recording how there's another book that really moves me um, called Compañeras. Um, for me, it is essential that, and I have to be honest and transparent about this, that rarely do I support white people writing the stories of people of color because we know how history has been written. But just like Hillary Klein's uh, book, Compañeras, uh, your book is not about you taking the credit for the work that these people have done, but it's about giving them a voice. Uh, they had their voice. It's about increasing, I should say, uh, the, the number of people that it will reach. And so tell us about what led you to travel uh, and meet these individuals. Wonderful. So in 2009, this wonderful selection committee we have for the Human Rights Award said, there's people you've never heard of in Northern El Salvador. They are standing up to mining companies who are flooding back into Latin America as mineral prices go up. In the case of El Salvador, they sit on a lot of gold. So gold prices were going up and the mining companies were flowing in. And these people learned that, that industrial mining is incredibly dangerous. They saw that it could threaten their river. And for your listeners who are from El Salvador, they know there's one big river that goes through El Salvador, providing water for over half the population, the Lempa River, and much of the gold is along its shores. And so they decided to fight back. So we were told, you know, we selected them for the award through this great committee. They told us, we usually bring two people. These people are great organizers. They said, we want to bring five people. We want you to set up a tour of the United States and Canada. The big mining companies here are Canadian. So we said, sure. And then the shock of our lives came about a month after we had informed them they were getting the award and we were setting up the trip. They said, one of the five uh, has been assassinated mm -hmm. for his work opposing gold mining. A shock to most people in this country. I mean, people in Latin America know that defending the environment is the most dangerous activist job right yeah. now in the entire region. So he was assassinated and we were in shock and we said, what can we do? And they said, bring us all and bring his brother. This, the, the man who was assassinated, Marcelo Rivera, almost 12 years ago today. So his younger brother, Miguel, came in his place. Now, normally people come and we give them the award and we, we bring them around and we get them on the radio and we raise their profile and then they go home. Mm -hmm. They made a special request to, to me and to my institute and to my wife, Robin, which is they got there and they said, look, one, we don't know as much about this company as we need to. And we know you've got good researchers. Mm -hmm. And two, they said out of nowhere, this mining company has sued our government of El Salvador for $300 million because the government slowed down the mine permitting process. And they say that, that the country should pay them $300 million and foregone profits. How is this possible? What is this tribunal help? And so it was a beautiful moment where I find the, the best international solidarity work is where, not where the people from the North come into the South and <laughs> tell people what to do. It's where people from the South say, here's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Here's our plan. Stay out of our lane. <laughs> help us when you can. But here's what we need from you. And can you help? And, and we said, sure. Um, we'd also set up a tour from them. The, the spokeswoman of this group, by the way, is a stunning organizer named Vitalina Morales. She spoke that night. She pressed it. She invoked this upside down world of, of Eduardo Galeano when, when she said, why is it that a corporation is suing our government when it is our communities and our government that's being hurt by the mining company? It should be the other way around, but it isn't. And so we got sucked in, Rafael, and we, and it was a beautiful thing. We had an incredible, we have an incredible Mexican colleague at the Institute, Manuel Perez Rocha. He knew some of the water defenders. So we had instant credibility with Manuel. And they gave us, they said, help us, let's communicate back and forth and let's see if we can fight this thing. I'm sure your listeners are thinking, okay, sure. A small community in El Salvador is going to beat back a giant mining company. Oh, and Vitalina that night said, 
we also we don't want to just kick them out. We want to we've studied mining and we realize the whole country is too ecologically fragile. We have too little water. We want to end mining in El Salvador yeah. and we want to beat this. We want to beat them in this tribunal. And we said, oh, my God, you know, bless you <laughs> will help. But it seemed like the most unlikely two wins that you could imagine in 2009. Yeah, definitely. And again, that's the, it's about finding your voice, right? A lot of indigenous peoples in El Salvador, in Guatemala and other places like that, anytime you raise your hand to protest, you're made to disappear. It has happened in Mexico in 68, right. continues to happen. When we talk about environment, Berta Caceres always comes right. to mind as one of many who have um, been made to disappear. Right. Um, you know, the 43 students in Mexico, so on. And I mean, the list is endless, as you well know. Yet when they find their voice, it doesn't matter how much danger they're in, right. they're going to go for it. Yeah. And again, at that moment, the only reason they may not necessarily give up, but stop the movement is because they don't have access to resources and they right. just got lucky and right. you were there and... You well, know? no, I wouldn't. I so we really, I would put put it on them. You you are right. These people, I mean, all good activists do this. They studied the issue. They found out about gold. They found out how dangerous it was. Yeah. They partly did it because, by the way, they were connected to Berta Caceres. Mm -hmm. They this is northern El Salvador. Berta mm -hmm. is southern Honduras. Mm -hmm. They all consider themselves Lenca people, mm -hmm. and they had met during the Salvadoran civil war because many of them had fled across the exactly. Lampa River. And got so the moment the, the miners started promising jobs and revenues and so on, they said, We're going to Honduras, we're going to go into Berta's networks here. The Hondurans welcomed them, brought them in, um, and uh, said, Sorry, um, said, We will help you out, brought them to a big open pit mine, and they saw the dangers. They saw so the key thing about gold mining, it uses cyanide mm -hmm. to separate the gold from the rock. And that's toxic. It yeah. gets in the rivers. It kills the fish. I mean, they watch these dead rivers. They watched the horrors of what mining can do. And they came back and said, we're going to fight this. And they were so creative. I mean, here we are sitting on a radio station. There's a brilliant youth-led community radio station in northern El Salvador. They did education there. They had forums. This guy, Marcelo, was a brilliant cultural worker. He. Mm -hmm. He led these caravans of laughter. They just, they threw everything at the mining companies and they won over the public. And then they went national and built a national coalition. And so they started this in 2004. By the time they got to us, they had a big, powerful national coalition, but they did realize that they were set up to lose even with all of that because the majority in the legislature were conservative. Mm -hmm. And because they didn't have a clue how to fight this this tribunal, so it was a beautiful kind of marriage. Of um, we we did it out of solidarity. We did it a lot, by the way, with the Salvadoran diaspora in this country. Um, we started holding protests at the World Bank. The Teamsters gave us this giant inflatable fat cat, which we put the the name of the company on. It was Pacific Rim at the time. And there's an incredible immigrant rights group that was smaller then. It's now bigger called CASA. Mm -hmm. And CASA has organized thousands of Salvadorans in the, in the Washington area, day laborers, many of them. They would come down in their break for lunch and protest outside the World Bank. So we, and in, same in Canada, they protested outside the headquarters of the company. We built great alliances. We got labor unions, faith groups, environmental groups, and we flooded the company with petitions. We flooded the tribunal while they were doing their work on the ground mm. in El Salvador. And I want to say, I mean, it's amazing, but still in mo nine cases out of 10, you'd still lose. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the rules of the tribunal are rigged and they are up against a country that desperately needs revenue. El Salvador's poor poor because of the horrible civil war that the U.S. Mm -hmm. supported the wrong side of. Um, and so I would still say as recently as 2015, if, if you had, 
if I had explained this to you then what we'd done, you'd say, okay, this is lovely, but you guys are going to lose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's part of, but we hung in there, you know, we knew we could lose. And I think good activists have this. We knew we could lose and we were doing the fight because we felt this should become a poster child of both why big industrial mining is bad for most countries, including the United States, and because we wanted to expose these rigged rules of this tribunal at the World Bank in Washington so that we could come back to fight somewhere else um, and win in another place. The Salvadorans also, I mean, they are more, as, as we were on the, a, a beautiful celebration of Marcella last night and Vidalina was on it, she said, we Salvadorans punch above our weight. Um, and they do, they I think had more optimism that they could eke out some victories than we did. And boy, were they right and we were wrong. And that is really, again, the energy that keeps you going. You are tired, you've been doing this for years. It's not right. a, a short-term situation, it's right. something that can, you know, and we know lawyers and law firms and huge corporations, they can continue to function yeah. in other places for as long as possible. And sometimes when they know that you have a limited amount of funds, for example, right. they'll just wait you out until you run out of funds. Uh, right. They'll send paperwork that you're not going to be able to make head or tails of. Uh, and as a result of that, they know that ultimately they have a higher likelihood that you're going to lose. But at the same time, again, movements are all about, uh, and in Latin America, that is the case, movements are all about keeping hope alive. Right. And as you right. said, nine out of 10 times you're going to lose, right. but you gave it your all, right? Mm -hmm. And some of these people, again, I think it's important to recognize, as we uh, mentioned before, they know that their lives are in danger and they right. know that they may never see the positive outcome from right. all of the work that they did. But it goes back to what we were talking about uh, prior to a recording, and that is um, the purpose of life. Right. Your purpose in life is to be of service to others. And that's it. Yep. Whether you see the fruits of your labor or right. not, it is, uh, it is essential. And I, that's why I love this quote. I'm going to read it uh, briefly. Um, that was uh, told by our good friend Vidalina. And she said, Marcelo was so much more than an environmental martyr. He was a seed who bore fruit, the fruit of this country banning mining. And again, that is exactly what it is. And yeah. so I, I, you know, for me, reading this book really, again, gave me that energy, that motivation once again right. to say, I've been doing my work here in my community for 25 years. You know, how much longer can I do this? I don't know, but I'm just going to keep on going. And, and I hope that people who read this book don't just read it and put it aside, but learn more about your institute and how can I get involved? And as a result of that, how can I be part of the change that needs to happen? And, and, and a key item here is, as I said at the beginning, not how I can go save those poor people because they need saving, right. but how do I stop talking listen and say, I'm just going to stand here or sit here. Whenever you need anything, raise your hand and I'll yeah. do whatever I can, right? Yeah. And that's exactly why your um, collaboration with, with this group, this organization was so powerful. Yeah, You, you never yeah. said, we're going to take care of you. We're going to take <laughs> care of everything. We are as lost as you are. Yeah. We're just here, you know, right. to support you with whatever we can. Yeah. It's true, and, and you know, a beautiful thing about Central America, say from where I live in Washington, it's closer to get to, to um, San Salvador than it is to get to California. Mm. The plane flight takes four hours. The flights are relatively cheap. So the core of this was building relationships. Mm. We brought a number of Salvadorans for tours of the US, Canada, and Australia. And in turn, we brought people down there who then went and spent time up in the, in the mountains. And through that, these relationships of trust were built that, that are beautiful mm -hmm. and that are, um, that that's the key to everything. So they trusted us, 
we trusted them. They did, you're right. <laughs> they, they had had four people assassinated by the time we'd been working with them for a year. Mm-hmm. And we, we were you know, blown away by this. And, and as we know in the Berta Caceres case, you know, these cases can go on for years and years before you find the masterminds behind them. And there's so much money moving yeah. around by the mining companies that you know, local mayors, they want these mines. Mm-hmm. So if you're standing up and you're being effective, you, you are in danger. And, and it's unequal, by the way, the gringos going down there, we never felt in as much danger. They don't, mm-hmm. they don't want to kill gringos because they don't want the wrath of, of the United States. Mm-hmm. It is the Salvadorans who put their lives on the line. I, I do want to say, I mean, for me also, because I think they, why, where they were way smarter than we were, <laughs> they knew they couldn't win without unlikely allies. They mm-hmm. knew they had to do something unpredictable and reach across political divides in that country. So, for example, you know, after St. Oscar Romero, the great archbishop mm-hmm. of El Salvador, was assassinated in 1980, the Catholic Church got smart and basically started appointing conservative archbishops. Yeah. Yet, to reach hundreds of thousands in that country, you need the church. So they reached out to this right wing, Opus Dei, conservative archbishop. He blew them off for months. He finally agreed to a meeting because they were so persistent. The meeting was going terribly. And then about two thirds of the way through, they happened to mention that you use cyanide and gold mining. And he just perked up and he said, oh my God. He said, I have a master's in chemistry. I know the dangers of cyanide would kill our rivers. What can I do? So they went over this guy, they went over a subsequent conservative archbishop, they went over even, so that civil war was, was, was death squads, you know, against a, a, a movement that was based in the, in the farmers of that country, the small farmers. Um, the death squad party, you know, controlled the legislature at this mm-hmm. time. They reached across and found a member of parliament who happened to have gone to school in the US was an environmentalist. And he saw that mining would kill the rivers and he became opposed. So their bravery here in the United States, it, it would be a little bit like reaching the Mitch McConnell. Yeah. I mean, it, would, it just took such guts, but they knew if they couldn't win over people in his party, they wouldn't win. So the astounding thing is, we win in the tribunal in 2016 because of, I think largely because of all this pressure. Also, El Salvador hired a brilliant lawyer, lawyer Luis Parada, who collaborated with us, who collaborated with the, the National Roundtable in, in El Salvador. And then one, one final thing I wanna say, Rafael, because you can get bamboozled or, or paralyzed by the power of these big companies. I would say one of the most important things we learned, partly because we got access to internal mining company documents, they made a lot of mistakes. And their biggest mistake was after the tribunal ruled against them, they just turned arrogant. They said, this is wrong. The tribunal said, you have to pay $8 million to El Salvador. They said, we're not paying these people. They're stupid. Um, And they also said, if you could just see our beautiful mine in the Philippines, you'd know how green and sustainable we are. So two big errors on their part. One, they they insulted even the right-wing legislators with those statements. So there's nationalism in that country. And two, um, Robin and I, Robin, my wife and I, who who wrote the book together, and another person in our team had been to the Philippines. We'd seen this mining company's mine. It was terrible. So we got together money. We brought this really great activist governor of that province in the Philippines to El Salvador. He testified before Congress. He exposed the mining company lies. And miraculously, in March 2017, that legislature voted unanimously (laughs) to make El Salvador the first country in the world to ban all metals mining to save its rivers. So two of the most unlikely victories, and all because of the genius, the persistence, and the bravery of these water defenders in El Salvador. Uh, and if they can do that there, imagine what we can do here in the richest country on earth. So I, I just, there's such inspiration from these people for all of us. Yeah, I, I love, and I'm sure I'm gonna uh, say it incorrectly, but you know, they asked this person 
forget when it happened, but they asked this person, like, why do you keep going when you know you're likely to lose? And their response is, what's the option, yeah. right? This is it. You just yeah. keep on going. And yeah. as you said, if you lose some, you continue to find ways. Uh, and it's interesting when you do it the legal way, right? Because yeah. you're just following the rules, but yeah. these corporations, they will find any and every way, including killing uh, these individuals to put a stop to this stuff. Money right. is so important to their investors that they're not, they don't care what's gonna happen. Right, yep. And it's beautiful to, to, again, read this book, The Water Defenders, because again, it gives you really a glimpse, as you said, into the uh, perspective of the uh, indigenous peoples of, of El Salvador, but also through the internal information that you share in there, the perspective of, in this situation, the invader, the, the corporation right. that thinks that it's going to be easy to just kind of get this done. Right. Um, they go and they offer all this money for land to all these individuals. And again, I think their error is that uh, they think that money is the most important thing. Right. When some of these people, their ancestors have lived there for millennia right. and to them the mother earth is the most important thing that we can have and these contaminants are just going to destroy your way of right. life and and that is the i think that you and your uh, partner when you wrote this book you did a wonderful job at allowing us to see uh, both perspectives on how this process was being done no, thank you so much. You know, the mining companies refused to talk to us. I mm -hmm. think they figured, what, what do we have to gain from mm -hmm. talking to these people? So we, we found it in other ways, including, I mean, to the credit, this is what's so interesting about that corporate world. A lot of the documents we got was a miner in El Salvador, who I think years later had second thoughts, and he gave all of these documents to a student of my wife, Robin, and she gave them to us. And boy, are those interesting. I mean, they yeah. did all the things you'd imagine. They, they would infiltrate meetings of the water defenders. They would, they would pay students to go and, 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 and yeah, and infiltrate. Mm -hmm. um, and they paid a lot of money for, for PR and to say, we are green, we are sustainable. Um, and it, it wasn't, I mean, the amazing thing is they, they didn't do a very good job. I would say th these companies, you know, in every company's, different, usually they are smart enough to go in and find local partners who mm -hmm. they then offer a lot of money to. Then they've got indigenous Salvadoran. These, were, these mining companies were so arrogant, they didn't even do that well. Yeah. So it, it's a reminder that, yeah, arrogance is, is um, something that you can use to your advantage. And, um, and, and so, yes, they're big, they're powerful, they have money, and yet they make a lot of mistakes. And yeah. our job is to figure out those mis mis mistakes, exploit them, and use, I mean, but at the end of the day, the amazing thing about the water defenders, they did a poll in 2015 in El Salvador, and they said, are you for mining or against it? 80% mm -hmm. said they were opposed. That's how good the education was yeah. of these folks. And, you know, employing the Catholic Church and others into their, pulling them into the the fight. And that's why there's a concern, you know, there's an authoritarian government in El Salvador nor right now, Bukele, and everyone's asking, okay, wow, is, and he controls the legislature. Are they going to put in a new bill to allow mining? He knows that 80, he has not taken any step in this direction. He knows that 80% of the public is opposed. He knows he can only do certain things that are unpopular. And so, as long as the edu they can keep up the education, I think El Salvador has a great chance to continue to be the country that, that paved the way towards this. And they are inspiring movements in other countries. Ecuador had a presidential candidate who ran against mining and got 20% of the vote. Chile just elected a bunch of people who, who are ran to save the environment in that mm -hmm. country. So it is spreading. The water defenders are in great demand that they're being, you know, recently went on a trip before the pandemic to Peru, also to Haiti. So, and and we spread the story in the Philippines. My wife and I went and, with the governor and people were so inspired there that they managed to stop the mining company there in his province and keep the government from renewing its 
it's mining contracts. So this story has been infectious. It, it is, um, it's spreading and it's inspiring people around the world. Yeah, definitely. And again, it's uh, the way the book is written, I should say, it really is a step by step as to what they did, what steps they took when they found kind of a roadblock, how did they go around that roadblock in order to attain the ultimate goal? And I think right. that, again, uh, whoever gets to read this book, um, I personally, as I was mentioning to you, in my Latin America and the Caribbean class, I use the book Compañeras, and I am considering definitely this book um, for future semesters, probably spring 2022, because it is a positive story. At the end of the day, there's obviously all these obstacles and everything else, but at the end of the day, just like Compañeras, it allows us to really understand there is hope out there People don't need you to go and liberate them and do all this stuff. They can take care of themselves if you're just there, but kind of let them do what they need to do. They don't yeah. need to be safe. They need to take care of themselves. And so taking that perspective, I think your book does a wonderful job at sharing that point of, you know, we're here, we will support, but we will never attempt to take over your movement uh, and then take credit for all of that stuff. So the way you share this story is, again, that's, that's the thing I really like. And that is, again, let me tell you the story of these indigenous people who took it upon themselves to fight for what was right. Yeah. And we just happen to be lucky enough to be present and witness a lot of this stuff. And, and I'm grateful because again, most people don't tell the story about it or narcissism is so big that we are like, <laughs> let me tell you the story about me being there and this is this. But in fact, you take it in the, you know, like, I'm just gonna tell you a story. Yeah. It is not my story. Uh, Rigoberta Menchu always calls it testimonial. Uh, testimony. I'm just going to tell you a story of something that happened, right? And I just happened to witness it, and that's it. Yeah. So yep. I am really, really happy with the way you wrote this book. And again, um, I invite everybody to take the time read this book. It is definitely uh, one that is going to give you hope in regards to um, protecting Mother Earth. I always tell people, it's like when people say, we need to save the planet. We don't need to save the planet. The planet will take care of itself. We are right. lucky to be able to be here. If we continue to destroy whatever is on the, you know, uh, uh, above ground, eventually Mother Earth is just going to say, okay, I gave you a chance. I'm just going to take a nap of 100 million years. <laughs> I'm going to go into an ice age, and then we'll see who I'm going to give the, the next chance. Right. And the sooner we realize that, the better. And so this is why this book is so essential. And I recommend people definitely read this. So thank you for uh, taking the time. Thank you for uh, being with us. I want to uh, end my piece, at least, with um, with the, uh, what is it called? The other quote that I really love um, by our good friend, uh, Vidalina, that says, death is not real death when your mission in life has been completed to the fullest. And so, you know, I thank you again for taking the time. I look forward to, um, you know, interacting with you in the future, uh, especially the work that you do is essential over there, uh, the Institute. So uh, John Cabana, I wanna thank you for being here today. Thanks so much, Rafael, it's a total joy. And if I could just end with the Berta Caceres quote we start yeah. with. She said, I knew we would triumph. The river told me so. Yeah. Thank you well, thank again. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. This is another interview for Líderes del Futuro here on KBBF 89.1 FM. If you are in Sonoma County, California, or Líderes del Futuro um, uh, on my YouTube channel, or of course, kbbf.org. Thank you, everybody.